Mindfulness, A Practical Guide to Awakening by Joseph Goldstein. The book explores how adopting a Buddhist approach to mindfulness can unlock a true and deeply felt freedom. The author draws on an ancient dialogue conducted by Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, and creates a clear systemic path to establishing mindfulness of body, emotion, thought, and time as a way to overcome suffering. When the Buddha taught the practice of mindfulness to his followers about 2,500 years ago, he called it the path to liberation. In his classic discourse, the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha said that through mindfulness, people can ease their attachment to the self and its endless cravings, and by doing so, they can banish pain and find lasting peace and freedom. In this summary, you will learn how to develop mindfulness not only of the body, but of the mind itself, how to balance the world of appearances against deep reality, and the path to extinguishing the self, and with it, sorrow. Siddhartha Gautama famously sat under a tree. For three decades, he had lived as a young prince, full of craving for the delights of the world, until, dissatisfied, he left his palace home to study under a series of spiritual teachers. Each teacher directed Gotama toward an ever more austere life, and for six years he lived in poverty, hunger and often, in a pain he inflicted on his own flesh. But the dissatisfaction that had driven him from the palace remained. It was then that Gotama came to the tree in Bodhgaya, a village in northern India. The story goes that he meditated beneath the tree for forty-nine days. His concept of self vanished, and with it the dissatisfaction that had plagued him. The unmindful life is characterized by a suffering caused by the self's endless craving. When Gotama rose, he was the Buddha, the awakened one. He walked on for several days to another village where he would share with friends the truth he had discovered. He told them that life is suffering, caused by things like war, hunger, injustice, sickness, and aging, yes, but also fear, hatred, envy, grief, and loneliness. The suffering the Buddha spoke of included people's longing for pleasure and the knowledge that one day everyone will be parted from their loved ones. It included the fact that the wonders of life end in death. The Buddha called this suffering dukkha. Human beings are like a dog, he said, tied to a post and unable to escape, forever pulling at the rope. He called this trap of suffering the wheel of samsara, or the cycle of life and death. He went on to say that the cause of people's suffering is desire. Everyone is consumed by a craving that cannot be satisfied. They seek it in food, alcohol, power, sex, and drugs, saying, I want, I need, I must have. And that craving makes fools of them all, as they take on debt, fill their lives with stress, and scrape to get ahead. They crave being someone else, a future self that is happy, successful, and powerful. At times, when it gets too much, they may even crave nothingness, to stop existing entirely. But there is a way to end the suffering. The Buddha teaches that when you let go of yourself, the craving goes with it, and you can at last find refuge in the highest happiness of all, Nibbana. The path to self-liberation requires work and inner strength to help you stay the course. When the Buddha died, 499 of his followers gathered to record all that he had taught them. One of these was Ananda, a beloved and close follower of the Buddha. Ananda had a legendary memory and knew the lessons of the Buddha, called the Dharma, better than anyone. And yet, to his embarrassment, Ananda had never achieved enlightenment. It had always eluded him. Then finally it happened. One day, after hours reciting the Dharma to the Buddha's followers, Ananda retired to bed. He had nothing left in him, nothing but the sensations of his own body as he moved down the hall into the bedroom and lay on the bed. His powerful mind had emptied, and he was pure sensation. In the moment before his head hit the pillow, he at last attained enlightenment. In the Satipatthana Sutta, 
The Buddha takes joy in telling his students how the body can lead the way to enlightenment. Begin, he advises, by sitting on the floor with your back straight and your legs crossed. Focus on your breath. Start by simply noting what is happening. I am breathing in. I am breathing out. Then take note of whether the breath is short or long. Eventually, you'll become aware of where you are in the breath, the beginning, middle or end. As you go on, you'll notice that you don't just breathe with your nose and your mouth, or your chest, abdomen or even lungs. Breath occurs through the whole body. When you feel your body producing and experiencing breath, that can lead to a mindfulness of the whole body and an experience of three great Buddhist truths. The first is impermanence. Feel your nerves spark with micro-sensations and note that these always pass. Second, witness the driving force of suffering. See how you shift positions to counter an ache in your tailbone or stretch to ease a cramp. Let it remind you that discomfort, even pain, compels much of what you do. Third and last, see how mindfulness of the body reveals the absence of the self. You are skin, bone, sinew, organs, bile, snot and tears. You are an interdependent system of things. There is no bigger you behind it. In this context, you, as the entity directing the system, are a fiction. Ajahn Chah, a 20th century teacher of a form of Buddhism, known as the Thai forest tradition, once travelled into the woods to spend a few days in solitude in a hut. On the first night, as he was settling into the stillness, a sound came blasting through the trees. Nearly, villagers were partying, playing music through loudspeakers. At first, Ajahn Chah was annoyed. Didn't the villagers know that a celebrated monk was in the woods contemplating Nibbana? He feared his retreat was ruined, but then he caught himself. For a moment, Ajahn Chah had allowed himself to suffer what Buddha called the same dart twice. He suffered the shock of the noise, and then suffered a graver injury, the noise of his own discontent. When you fail to be mindful of your feelings, a pleasant feeling can awaken greed, an unpleasant one can awaken distaste or even hatred. And when a feeling is neutral, you may fail to recognize it at all. Then ignorance grows. Worse, these unhelpful states reinforce your sense of selfhood and lead to suffering. Greed urges the feeding of the self, which leads to addiction, self-importance, and longing for more. Distaste and hatred build the self in opposition to and against the world. And ignorance thickens the veil of your delusions. The Buddha instructs his followers to interrupt this cycle with mindfulness. Note the tone of your thoughts and feelings, he said. Ask yourself, what's the attitude of my mind right now? Or simply, what is happening? In response, avoid attaching yourself to the thought or feeling. So instead of saying, for example, I am angry, try the angry mind, is like this. Don't judge yourself harshly for ugly thoughts and feelings. Shame only digs you further into yourself. An ugly thought or feeling is just a visitor. Note it, let it be independent, and let it pass. Of course, not all thoughts and feelings are traps made of misery. Soon, you'll learn how mindfulness of goodwill, generosity, and compassion can cultivate a liberating mindset. But before you get there, it's time to explore how your mind itself may hinder you on the path to self-liberation. Think of the mind as a pool. When you're mindful, the pool is clear and calm. It faithfully reflects the reality of its surroundings. But certain states of mind can trouble the water. Greed is like a dye, discoloring your perceptions. Distaste and hatred heat the water to a boil. Laziness is like alga growing across the surface. Restlessness is like ripples caused by the wind. And doubt and indecision are a thick mud that blocks the light. Mindfulness, the Buddha said, is the key to clearing away these hindrances. As natural and as numerous as these hindrances to perception are, repeated diligent, 
mindful examination of their presence will bring you back to a central truth. They are not you, and you are not them. They'll pass, and when they do, you'll better appreciate what you are, and that's pure potential, specifically, the potential for clear, calm, and brilliant reflection. But it isn't just mindfulness that will help you on your journey to awakening. You have some other natural capacities to help you on the way. First, the capacity for discernment or a knack for testing ideas and digging for the truth. Second, you have energy to drive you toward accomplishment. Third is rapture or pure joy, something that, when you experience it, leaves no room for malice or greed. Fourth is true calm, a serenity that quiets the mind. Fifth are the stores of concentration you're capable of, and last, you carry the potential for goodwill and generosity. To cultivate these capacities, you should use a mindfulness practice to note them and contemplate their nature. When you find yourself being instinctively skeptical about something, say to yourself, this is discernment. On the other hand, when you catch yourself having swallowed someone's argument whole, observe that discernment was absent. When calm occurs, consider what triggered the feeling. Was it the presence of a loved one, perhaps? If it lingers, contemplate why, and when it fades, note its passing. If you practice being mindful of these natural capacities that you already have, you can intelligently work to increase their presence within you. Used together, they're like the arm, the hand, the handle, the blade, and the sheath that in unison allow a warrior to wield a sword. Here's something to try. The next time you walk down the street, silently send every person that passes the following wish. May you be happy. Send it to the man waiting for the bus, the woman sweeping the sidewalk in front of her store, the kid on the skateboard, and the teenage girl walking her dog. May you be happy. This sending of good will is what the Buddha called metta, and what contemporary Buddhists often call loving-kindness. Let's say you try this experiment of loving-kindness for a few days, and you find yourself wondering, are these passers-by appreciating my loving-kindness? Or maybe you find yourself wishing of passers-by. May you be less annoying to me. If you catch these moments, well done. You're being mindful of your thoughts. Even better, you've snagged some unwholesome intruders. As always, make a habit of mindfully noting them without judgment. Now feel the beneficial transformation that comes from letting the visitor pass. But you may run into another challenge in your practice of loving-kindness. Let's say that on the street, someone in dire straits, how should you regard someone who is suffering? Here, the Buddha urges compassion. Show empathy. Try to feel what is going on for those in pain. This can be difficult. The mind often withdraws or defends against the pain of others, but mindful habits will tell you that this tendency is a hindrance to true perception because it shows attachment to the self. Instead, be courageous and open your heart. In situations where you can end the suffering, you must do so. When you can't, a gesture of friendship or generosity may do more than you think. Keep in mind that those who are suffering may not appear to be victims. Abusers and bullies are suffering, and they too deserve your compassion. Take the example of Dr. Tenzin Chodak, a Tibetan physician and follower of the Dalai Lama. Chinese authorities imprisoned Chodak and tortured him for almost two decades. By Chodak's account, it was his compassion for his torturers and their suffering hearts that allowed him to survive. In the Sati Pathana Sutta, the Buddha outlined his rules for living in the world, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. In right speech, you must always tell the truth, avoid gossip, speak with love, and listen mindfully. In right action, you must not kill, steal, or harm. You must not, for example, take more than you need. You must abstain from sexual misconduct. As for right livelihood, a good Buddhist may not trade weapons, intoxicants, or meat. Discussion of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration 
which is to say that the Buddha leaves the ball of moral action in your court. It's up to you to exert the effort to be mindful of people's interconnectedness, and it's up to you to concentrate, discern the action that's needed, and take that action. You mustn't, for instance, intentionally kill insects simply because they give you the willies. But what do you do if you're in a malarial region and have been asked to spray a mosquito insecticide? What will a good Buddhist do? That's for you and your mindfulness to discern. By relying on mindfulness, the Buddha teaches that rules are not as important as the truth that animates them, namely, that the world of appearances is a shallow reality, and that deep reality is selfless and without separation. Live with awareness of that truth, and not only will right action follow, but that truth will become ever more real to you. You'll glimpse it. You'll see Nibbana. Thank you for listening and subscribe to the channel for more.